If you will, please open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 3. No surprise, we have a tremendous amount of content tonight. No surprise. We're going to start it right off with verse 1, which says, Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. We almost could have concluded this verse last week as we went over the battle that had taken place between Abner and Joab and all of the bloodshed. And, and essentially, one of the things we talked about with that is sometimes a moment triggers and puts things into motion that are going to be unfolding for a pretty good amount of time. And that's exactly what happened as they were at the pool of Gibeon last time we were in this. It started off with just a little bit of like, let's let the playful boys horse around a little bit. And it went to murder super fast. And they all killed each other, all, all 12 on each side. And then that turned into an all out battle and none of these things were sanctioned by either one of the kings, right? But as this is going on, this long war that it's talking about, the house of Saul and the house of David, David's portion of this is growing stronger and Saul's is growing weaker and weaker. And so the very first thing I, I, I've been seeing from this as I've been studying is this being a kind of picture of sanctification. So I want to go over some really wonderful, blessed verses and just kind of talk about that. There, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, one of my favorite portions of Scripture. Sorry. That's me. That's all me. That makes sense as I've been looking around the room a little bit. Am I up there? Okay. Good. So 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone, if anyone is in Christ... That person is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And something that we've talked about on Wednesday nights is the idea of already and not yet. So when it comes to this new creation, I think we might have some questions. Like, wait, if I'm a new creation, then how come I don't? necessarily look new or feel new or how come the same old things are still the same old things and this is the conversation about sanctification so galatians 2:20 says i have been crucified with christ it is no longer i who live but christ lives in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me so the idea of this is the old man is dying and the new man in Christ is living and continuing to grow. And it's very much like this house of David and this house of Saul. This house of David, this one in Christ is growing stronger and the other one is dwindling. It's growing weaker and weaker. And I, I wanna encourage my brothers and sisters here tonight because we all have things, every single one of us. My goodness, if we only had a thing, that would be great. But we probably have things. We probably have some thorns, things that still kind of get our side but the Lord intends for us to grow in him that these things would be weaker, that we would continue on in that path of sanctification. And also, just I, I'm a person who likes clarity. There is no difference in regards to the word sanctification and holiness in the New Testament. It is the same exact Greek word. Sanctification essentially is the process in which we are becoming holy. And holy is kind of that state that we think about that is the state that God is. But we are called to that. And, and everything can really kind of be boiled down to the simplicity of not whether or not we read our Bible today or not whether or not we prayed so many times or faced towards the east or towards the west as we did so. But it really just comes down to a question of holiness. Holiness. Where am I in regards to God and in regards to holiness? Not in regards to legalism, but in regards to my Father who is holy and my calling to be holy as he is holy. I must decrease for this, and he must increase for this. And then another one we have here is 2 Timothy 2, starting with verse 19. It says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 
And this is the idea in which we are going to leave the things that cause us to not be holy. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. So basically, like, you have your fine china, and you got the stuff that you bought at Walmart, like, 15 years ago that somehow won't die. Like, it's still around, right? Some of these things have honor, and some of these things not so much. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, from the things of dishonor, if we cleanse ourselves from those things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, that's that word, and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So as things are working out between the kingdom of David and this kingdom of Saul, and we see the things of God and God's kingdom is growing and increasing, I can't help but look at the kingdom of God in myself and or in the lives of the church and consider the same war that is being waged and what the state of that war is and how the kingdom of sanctification, the kingdom of holiness, has been called to grow in our lives. So now with verse 2, verse 2, we're going to get into some territory here. The sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam of the Jezreelites. His second, Chileb by Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. The third, Absalom, the son of Makkah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. The fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. The fifth, Sephatiah, Sephatiah the son of Abital. The sixth is Ithrim by David's wife, Egla. A little Scottish in here with a couple of these names. It says, these were born to David in Hebron. Now, this is where I'm going to like just bring a little bit of my opinion into this. So I'm giving a warning. This is a section that I'm not really very fond of. I'm not really very fond of this whole area of multiple wives and these families that are being raised by multiple wives. And the reason for that is because we have in this section a violation. We know David's not perfect, but David really is quite an exemplary person by God himself stating that he has a heart unlike anybody else's. David really just is a wonderful person. But when you have somebody who really bears the likeness of God and has these unique attributes, we know that there's going to be failings. We know that they need a savior. But to see the areas where these failings are, it's just hard. And that's going to be this chapter for sure. So it says in Deuteronomy 17, 17, it's talking about kings here. These are the rules for kings. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Now, I have to admit, Pastor Ken and I, we were talking about this earlier in the week, and he said something, and I went, oh, man, yeah, that would be me for sure. And, and here's what he said. Um, you know, David didn't really necessarily struggle Solomon might be a different example of that, right? A person who just really accumulated some wives. But maybe David's thinking, that's not my heart. My heart is for the Lord. So yeah, I might be on two, three, four, five, but it's okay, it's okay. It's not getting out of control, sort of I can quit at any time, right? And, and that's the thing is like, sometimes we end up talking ourselves into something that we have control over, right? We might be good with that. So, like, some other men, they could not handle three wives. But Lord, I got three wives and I'm still taking ground for you. David was still bringing glory to God. David was still living for God. But here's the thing, like, that's what I'm saying. This is, this is like, this would be me. Like, I would figure out how I can glorify and live for God in the areas where I know I'm called to. And then in other areas where there might be laws and stuff, I might figure out my own deception and the ways around it for justification. There's nothing new here. This is an area where David is maybe possibly having that kind of justification. We're not given the reasons why. We just know that he has multiple wives. The one wife in here that I'm like, okay, um, this right here, um, the one from Absalom, from Makkah, this is the daughter of the king of Geshur, which is not their territory. That's outside the territory of Israel. And we know when it comes to politics, sometimes there will be daughters exchanged in regards for peace and, and treaties with kingdoms and everything. Okay, 
All right. But that's not his only wife, right? There's multiple wives. So I really like something that Guzik says here. He says, David was troubled because of his many wives. Some wonder why the Bible doesn't expressly condemn David's polygamy here. And, and I was definitely one of those people. I'm like, hey, pastor, how come, how come, how come? And here's what he goes on to say. As often is the case, the scripture simply states the fact and later records how David reaped the penalty for this sort of sin in regards to his family. Now, one time I was driving home from work and I remember I was doing probably 20 miles an hour, 20, 20 miles an hour over the speed limit on a back road. It was like nobody else around and everything. But it was one of those things where as I'm driving very quickly on that back road, oh, by the way, this is all many years ago. Would never, many years ago. So as I'm, as I'm driving like this on the back road, I'm, I'm having a great time, but I'm also kind of doing one of those like little side eye things, just kind of looking around for the boys in blue, right? And, and I remember thinking, no cops, no foul, you know? And I remember thinking, boy, the Lord could really bust me right now, but he's not. Thank you, Lord. And, and I just, like, you know, I, that, that was just a really brief moment in which I was thinking about my sins and whether or not these things might be recorded or not. And there are so many things that are not recorded as such, just like it was talking about with polygamy. It's not necessarily recorded. However, let's take a look at this. Um, I'm going to come back to this family thing, but let's examine this first. Number one, Amnon, one of his sons that are mentioned here, he raped his half-sister and was murdered by his half-brother. Chileb is also known as Daniel, which I should have been calling him that the whole time. The few mentions of this son indicate that perhaps he died young or that he was an ungodly, unworthy man because there's just really nothing said. Absalom was murdered by his half-brother and led a civil war against his father David, attempting to murder his own father. Adonijah tried to seize the throne from David and David's appointed successor. Then he tried to take one of David's concubines and was executed because of his arrogance. We can fairly assume that Shephatiah and Ephraim either died young or were ungodly and unworthy men because they are mentioned only once again in the scriptures in a generic listing of David's sons. So out of all these sons that are referenced here in the beginning of this chapter, this is how things play out. This is what it looks like. Now, um, I had to decide, I always decide this at the very last minute, what the title of the teaching is going to be. And I said decisions. And I think I regretted that as soon as I told him decisions because really what it came down to was the word decisive, decisive. When it came to family, this happened to be an area where David was not strong when it came to family. David was so strong in so many areas, but when it came to his family, there were decisive moments where he did not stand fast, where he did not step up, where he did not administer the things that were needed decisively in those moments. And this chapter definitely covers that. So we have David who's just kind of accumulating more wives, right? And we see some of the outcome of that. And, and the reason why I have family here really kind of is because like for some of us, we're not necessarily in the place where Jesus is Lord of our family. We're not necessarily in the place like, like where David wasn't making some of the decisive decisions based on what God was saying. Sometimes we might do the same thing and we're not allowing the Lord to be Lord of our family or of our family schedule or how we approach things on the weekends or how we approach things on the weekdays. He may not be Lord of that. That might be my wife, Lord, not yours. That might be my ch child or my business, how I run my family and not yours. And this is, I think, one of those things that we don't talk about too often. So however the Lord is speaking to you in this room, what he's leading to you, I'm not gonna say too much more than that, but it's something that it's definitely, I mean, you can probably see it, you know? It's probably one of those things where in any given church of any given size, you might see little hints and signs of these kinds of things here and there. And it might just be the person who's looking back at you in the mirror. So as we move on from family, with verse six, it says, now it was so, while there was war between the house of Saul 
and the house of David that Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. If you remember, Abner was the right-hand man to Saul. He was his chief general. And he had, in the last chapter, a very strategic political move in order to have Ishbosheth, the last son of Saul, be made king. And one of the things we looked at is that Saul was um, his nephew. He was the uncle to Saul. And Ishbosheth was the last in line for that throne. And Abner may have been doing a power grab there, but it certainly seems like he's having a power grab here. He's strengthening himself in the house of Saul. As a result of this, we have this situation. And I'm going to tell you right now, I have really searched as much as I can to come to a conclusion. You guys are going to have to make your own decision on, chap on verse 7 here tonight. It says, Saul had a concubine, this is King Saul, whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ahiah. So Ishbosheth said to Abner, why have you gone into my father's concubine? What I'm going to say from that, well, actually, I'm going to hold it. Let's see what Abner says here. I don't have to tell you because you all read ahead. You know what Abner said. But let's just review. Verse 8 says, Then Abner became very angry at the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today I show loyalty. Today I show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and have not delivered you into the hands of David. And you charge me today with a fault concerning this woman. May God do so to Abner and more also, if I do not do for David as the Lord has sworn to him. I'm going to hit the brakes right there. So right here, as the Lord has sworn to him, he kind of just gave it up. We know from this statement that Abner knows where David is supposed to be in this picture. We know that he is very much in the know of God's plan for the kingdom. And we also know what Abner has already done to seize it for himself and for his purposes, having kind of a sort of puppet king that he can have his own way with. So he goes on to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. These are very strong words by Abner. So strong, the response by Ishbosheth is this. He could not respond to Abner another word because he feared him. So Abner, Abner is a, he's a force to be reckoned with. And here he goes off on him. Now the question about the concubine, I don't know. I don't know if there is something in which he was doing something inappropriate with the concubine or not. It certainly seems he knows what he's talking about. Maybe he was showing kindness. Maybe he was, you know, make, giving some provisions. I don't exactly know. But if he was actually trying to take Saul's concubine, it would have been considered a treasonous move to usurp the actual king and assume that role in that position as king. Maybe that's what was going on. Maybe Ishbosheth didn't like the amount of power that Abner was having. And he says, hey, why are you hanging out with this woman like this? We're not really given that information. So it must not be that important. All we know is there is some major squabble. This is kind of like the best laid plans of mice and men. God's going to have his day, right? We can plan whatever we want to plan. Ishbosheth is king. Abner is pulling the strings. But the bottom line is the Lord's going to work it all out. So they have this plan. They have this kingdom now. And the whole thing is quickly falling apart already. And so Abner, this very strong man, turns out he's starting to side over with the plan that God has for the kingdom and for David. Which brings up loyalty. <laughs> so in regards to sides, right, which side is Abner on? Is he on the king's side here? Is he on the king's side here? Was he loyal to Saul? Is he becoming loyal to David? Is he looking for opportunities? I, I can't help but be reminded of the book of Joshua. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? 
right? So which side are you for? Are you for Saul or are you for David? And he says, no. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. This is one of my favorite places in scripture for really what's, what's happening between the sentences here. It says, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped him and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandals off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. And the, one of the reasons why this is like one of my, oh wow, favorite moments is because of this word right here. He falls with his face to the earth and he's worshiping the commander of the Lord's army. Well, who could possibly accept and receive worship as the commander of the Lord's army? Joshua was in a very, very special place here. And I can't help but think this has got to be this Christophany where Jesus is the commander of the Lord's army. The head of the church, the king of kings, is also the commander of his army. There are no sides here, but man's side and God's side. So Abner, he, he might be looking for moves and, and trying to switch sides and everything like that. We're going to see he's very good at that. But David's not really trying to choose sides. and He's not looking for advantageous things. David is trying to seek what the Lord is about. And, and this is, listen, it's really easy for us to say things like this. It's really easy for us to get this right on paper and on the test. Like, whose side should we be on? We should be on the Lord's side. When it comes to our life and when it comes to the actual decisions that we have to make, the choices, the choices that we're making now that are going to matter in the next season, the next year, 10 years from now, the kind of legacy we're living for, the things we're setting up, things like that, sometimes those are a little bit foggy. Sometimes those are much more gray. But for us to be thinking more in mind for what is the Lord doing here and what is he calling me to to be faithful in? So in verse 12, it says, Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David saying, whose land is this? This is such, it's like nothing is new. This question that's very relevant here for us today, nothing is new. Whose land is this? And the reason why he's asking like that is, is he's kind of setting this up for a confirmation to submission to David, saying also, make your covenant with me, and indeed my hand shall be with you to bring all of Israel to you. So he's saying, it's your land, David. Set this up with me. We'll establish a covenant, and this will all be over. We'll move Israel towards you. David said, good. I will make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. The only thing that he requires is his first wife that was given away. And it seems certainly that David is in a season where he's collecting wives, right? He now has six already mentioned. David, I, I believe, as far as the official record goes in scripture, the total number is eight. Michael will make the seventh. Bathsheba makes the eighth. There are some children that are referenced of David where there is no mother that is assigned to that association. But as far as we know, there's eight total. But he wants number one back. So David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, give me my wife, Michael whom I betrothed to myself for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, from Paltiel, the son of Laish. Then her husband went along with her to Baharim, weeping behind her. So Abner said to him, go return. And he returned. Remember, Abner is a force to be reckoned with. But this brings up area number five. America is not equal to Kurios. So let's rewind here for just a second. Ishbosheth sent and took her, the bride, from her husband. And I just want you fellow Americans to think for just a moment now. Whoever is president today and tomorrow, whoever's in office, what would it be like if the president 
called your wife away from you to go send her off to a foreign king in a foreign land. That is not very American. We are not familiar with this kind of politic. We're not familiar with a Lord. We are very, very removed from this kind of culture. But look at how quickly and look at how easily, and then look at the sad, sad response. No muskets, just weeping. This husband is following his wife, futility, there's nothing he can do, weeping behind her, and basically Abner just barks at him like a dog, and he goes yipping off to where he came from. If a Lord wanted to take your wife, that was the decision. If a Lord wanted to take your life, that was his decision. So when it comes to America, America is not very familiar with a culture of kurios, because kurios means this word right here, Lord, Lord. What does Lord mean? Like the closest thing we have to that is landlord. And these days that doesn't mean very much, not very much. But Lord, this word kurios, what it means is supreme authority. Supreme authority. So if I were to say, um, you know, who do you work for and who's your boss and manager and everything, there's gonna be a certain degree and level and measure of authority of a person like that in your life. Not supreme authority, not supreme. If the person has the power to call your spouse out to send that spouse off to a foreign land, that's some crazy level of authority. That's the kind of thing that scares us. We don't like that for good reason. Isaiah 43, 11 says, I even, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I am the Lord. Luke 2, 11 says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Remember, this is anointed one. The anointed one to be Lord. To be kurios. To be supreme in authority. Luke 6.46 then takes that idea of lordship. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Like doubling it up here, but getting really serious. Why do you say Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Remember what we were just talking about with Lord and the power that a Lord has and the authority that a Lord has, but you're not doing the things that I say. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you what this person is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against it and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. You know, very often I hear these verses and this whole story associated with, I believe in Jesus, without really looking at the text to see if what Jesus is saying about belief, because the context is not about belief, the context is about hearing and doing because this is about his lordship. You call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things that I tell you to do. But let's just pause for a moment here to really, really praise the Lord because the way that we're looking at earthly lords, it's scary. For an earthly lord to have supreme authority, there's a reason why we have the phrase, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But with Jesus' absolute authority, he waits, he invites, he gives opportunity, he equips and he empowers. And then the question comes down to if we will take hold of it, because he doesn't just go and take hold of us. He doesn't say, well, I'm the commander of the Lord's army, so I'm gonna grab some troops here and there's some real VBS monsters over here, we're gonna move them out into the bush over in, in these far off lands. The Lord just calls gently 
And, and one of the things I really, um, I'm gonna move over to a slightly different thing that just has to do with our Devo, our daily prayer life and everything. Um, I, I don't know who first said it, but I've, I've heard it said that the Lord is a gentleman and he doesn't take. Sometimes we pray for the Lord, please take this from me. And, and I will say this from my, I don't know if I've ever heard this before, but just totally, definitely in my own experience. I have never experienced, honestly, the Lord taking anything ever from me, no matter what I've ever prayed. Now, like, if you have a testimony about that, great. But, but my experience with the Lord is this. Anything you want to give me, I will receive. But the decision comes up from me if I will give it to him, because he's not just going to go and take and snatch. The Lord is not interested in this kind of fellowship where it's like, Lord, I don't have the ability, the strength, the power to let go of this, so you're going to have to take it. That's not the way he's Lord. He's Lord by our willing, desire, joyful submission, where when our mind is changed, when there is that repentance and we're no longer thinking the same thing and we want to be done with that thing, the Lord's like, well done, my good and faithful servant. We enter into that joy in the things that we let go of and the things that he becomes Lord over. So he's Lord, not the way that we understand lords here. He is the king, he is the commander, but his lordship is different. It is by a sweet, beautiful, benevolent, optional choice to follow and to follow hard after. Verse 17 says, Abner had communicated with elders of Israel, saying, in times past, you were seeking for David to be king over you. Now then do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. How's the red showing up there? Because that was an issue with the previous bulb. It's looking good now? Okay. So... Abner, again, he knows exactly what the Lord is planning. But the thing that we've been studying with Abner and with Joab are two men who are really kind of about doing what they want to do regardless of whatever they know is right. Whatever they know is right. Now we're getting back to America. This is definitely our land and our territory. The truth will prevail. Maybe this is encouraging to some. Maybe this is scary to some. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So this kind of information, I've actually been tracking with this since 1 Samuel, trying to see if there was any official confirmation declaration everyone knew. Because, you know, one of the cases I was trying to make in the very, uh, I think it was last chapter, in chapter 2, was, okay, so the king dies, what should you do when the king dies? I guess you should take the, the next in line for the kingdom as far as that family goes. And Abner's trying to set things up quickly. I'm trying to give Abner the benefit of the doubt. But from this chapter, we know that he already knew and he was about his own business. And all this truth is coming out now. So with verse 19, it says, and Abner also spoke in the hearing of Benjamin. Now, Benjamin is the land of who? A little louder? Saul is from Benjamin which is right next to Judah. They border each other, right? So he brings this case to Benjamin last, because it may not sound so great. Hey, land of Saul, right next to the kingdom of David, we're gonna go the way of David. And Abner went to speak in the hearing of David after this in Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel and the whole house of Benjamin. So Abner and 20 men with him came to David at Hebron. And David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. Then Abner said to David, I will arise and go and gather all Israel to my Lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. And I want you guys just to imagine for just a moment that you're David. And this is the guy where it's like, man, like, you know, like in sports, it's like there's that one guy on the team where if he's injured for the game, it's like, oh, okay, we're good. We're going to be okay. That's really Abner for this whole kingdom of King Ishbosheth. Without Abner, without this support, there's no backbone to the kingdom. There is no structural support to the military, to the, the sway of the people. And not only that, but Abner is going to all these territories and he's rallying everybody and he's promising, I will arise and go and gather all of Israel to my lord, the king. 
And if I'm David, this is good news. This is good news. If I'm the Red Sox, we don't have to play the Yankees this year. It's, it's going to be much better. This is good news. They're coming over to our team. We're going to be unstoppable. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Abner was called out by David in 1 Samuel, embarrassed in front of thousands of troops, and basically makes the case that you should be put to death for not defending your king. How was I able to just walk into this camp and take the spear and take the jug? Abner, shame, shame. This word reconcile, this is what we were made for, guys. This is the business that the Lord is in, to reconcile his lost to himself. And this is the business that he has called us in. Check out 2 Samuel chapter 5. It's one of my favorite sections, 17 through 22 or something like that. But man, the business that we're called to in this ministry of reconciliation, this is such great stuff. Reconcile means to change mutually. This Greek word, katalasso to change mutually. And, and like the picture that the Lord gave me in this is basically, like when I was a kid, I used to have a lot of fun with magnets, too much fun with magnets. Am I the only person in the room who destroyed more than one TV with a magnet as a kid? Doesn't sound like it. So um, magnets can be very strong and very powerful, but if you reverse them, that same strong attraction now pushes away very strong. And that's the picture that I get when there is conflict, right? The Lord didn't make us for this pushing away. It is like impossible. If you take two magnets, right, and you have them with the, the poles, is it opposite? I didn't research this. Uh, the same poles, right? There's the push if it's the same poles, right? Okay, so if we have, if we have the magnets and we set them up for the same poles, I, Again, as a kid, I, th there was no internet. I didn't have video games back then. I was playing with magnets and I was like trying to figure out at what point will they stay? What do I have to do to make them stay? And it never stops being in their nature to resist. They never stop pushing. If they're reversed though, if there's that mutual change and then they're brought together, they go to this perfect alignment. So much so that even like our phones now have these magnetic alignments and everything like that. So things just go where they're supposed to. And that is this picture of reconciliation. The Lord, instead of like, imagine before you were a Christian, the relationship that you could possibly have with the Lord, there's nothing that we could do to please the Lord. There's nothing. No matter what we might have thought we could do to please the Lord, the reality was there was nothing that we could do to please the Lord. We were like those opposing magnets. But the Lord always desired and went after us as that magnet that's like, come on, just flip around. And then once we do, there is that, there is that connection that should remain unless it is really, really ripped apart, but should just align beautifully and stay. This reconciliation, this happens right here in chapter 3 with Abner and David. There is this sweet reconciliation that takes place there. And if you remember... The starting point with Abner and David is right here in 1 Samuel 17. It says, then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Goliath, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Now, just think about this man, Abner, this rough man that we've been talking about, this man who is a formidable and everything, and he hasn't gone out to fight Goliath, but here comes this little kid who is formidable. And you got to just think like there was this moment between Abner and David where he's like, look at you, kid. Look at you. Come bring that head in here. My, my, my boss is going to love this. And there's this moment between the two of them. And now there's another one, and Abner seems fantastic. So the chapter should end really well. But you guys read ahead. So verse 22 says, at that moment, the servants of David... And Joab came from a raid and brought much spoil with them. So they're already, they're doing well, right? They've got much spoil. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away and he had gone in peace. So Abner goes with the peace of David. When Joab and all the troops that were with him had come, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king and he sent him away and he has gone 
in peace. Confirmation, right? Like we, we know the Lord is making this clear, repeating it a number of times. We have peace here. We have reconciliation. Then Joab came to the king and said, what have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away and he has already gone? Surely you realize that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you, to know you, to know you're going out and you're coming in, and to know all that you are doing. Why was Joab thinking these things? What reason, what, what evidence, what existed for Joab to come to David with these kinds of accusations? And this brings up number eight assumptions. Maybe I'm the only person here who assumes things, but I have found, well, let me just say it this way. Not only do we assume things all the time, we could, we, we could not operate as human beings without assuming things all the time. I assumed that the stage would hold me when I walked up here. I assumed that our team would have the microphone turned on. I assume that when the light turns green, I'm gonna be safe when I drive through the intersection. We assume things all the time, all the time. It's necessary, it's beyond necessary for us to function with logical assumptions of things all the time. What's not logical, what's not healthy, is when we assume things and speculate things that are based off of thoughts and ideas that are not from God, not from logic, from pain or bitterness or hurt. And that's exactly what we have with Joab. We have assumptions in regards to Abner, and they're not based on anything except for his own revenge, bitterness. This is the man that just took his brother's life. And that doesn't go so well in that household and he's not okay with it. Matthew 16, 21 says, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Let's pause there for just a moment. I don't know how many people in the room would say amen. I know me. I know I'd be that guy. I know I would be that guy to rebuke the Lord for saying something wrong. And the way that works is it's wrong in my head. And if it's wrong in my head, it's wrong. When we have these kinds of assumptions that are based on me, myself, and I, then we're flying without the Lord. We're not basing things on his truth. We're basing things on my truth. We all do this to some different degrees. We have to correct this. We have to bring this into the place under the ownership of our Lord. We have to take the things that have nothing to do with our agenda, our revenge. We have to submit these things to the Lord. Because he rebukes the Lord. Peter says, and I got to think, Peter's heart was in the right place. It's just his whole heart and mind were in the wrong place. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. In fact, he might be like Joab, thinking, no one's stepping up. I'll say something, because this is not going to happen on my watch. What a great manly thing to do. It's such a natural man, though. It's not a godly man. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Just calls it out right there. The things that you have on your mind are not the things of my Father. They're the things that are natural to you. It's the same kind of language that Jesus uses early on when he's being tempted. He says, get behind me, Satan, when he was tempted 40 days in the wilderness. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus is all about the enemy getting behind him. Get out of my way. I don't want to contend with you. Get behind me. I'm not having this argument. We're not doing this. Get behind me. And Joab has this moment with David, and then he leaves there because Joab is a decisive man. When Joab had gone from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner who brought him back from the well at Sarah. So Abner is, he's gone out and he hears, hey, hey, come back. 
But David didn't know about this. And my question is why? Why didn't David know about this? I mean, it's really self-explanatory why David didn't know about it. But like to have a person who is the king and to also do whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want, it kind of sounds like Christianity. It kind of sounds like we have a king who sees everything, knows everything, and yet here we are possibly doing whatever we want whenever we want it. It's the same kind of thing. So it's not, it's not far removed from us. Let's not look at Joab and be like, oh my goodness, what a monster this person is. He's just operating as a natural man. And this goes to this next thing, which is decisive. And this really is, I, I think, a major theme. Joab was, he wasn't going to wait for things, just like Peter wasn't going to wait for Jesus to die for him to rebuke him. Peter was going to get after it. Joab was going to get after it. And like I said, I am this kind of guy. I am the guy who might speak first and then come to repentance later and realize that my ways were not his ways. He was very decisive. There's things about this, there's things about Joab that in scripture are lauded. They're, 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 he's, he's called courageous and he stands fast in regards to situations where armies are surrounding all of them. And he's like, listen, I'm gonna take these guys. You be brave and take those guys. The Lord will be with us. Like he says things like that. Joab has its moments, but Joab is out for Joab. Joab is living for Joab. Verse 27 says, when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately and there stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Like just straight prison. Afterward, when David heard it, he said, my kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and on all his father's house and let there never fail to be in the house of Joab one who has a discharge or is a leper who leans on a staff or falls by the sword or who lacks bread. These are strong words from David. David is not pleased with what just happened. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner. Now, we don't exactly know the role. We just know Abishai is in on it. We have three brothers, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Asahel, fleet of foot, chases after Abner, doesn't stop, doesn't slow down, doesn't turn from side to side, and he gets it, and he dies. Joab and Abishai, they go out, and they seek vengeance. They kill Abner because they killed his brother Asahel at the Battle of Gibeon. Now, in verse 31 says, David said to Joab, to all the people who were with him, tear your clothes, gird yourselves with sackcloth, and mourn for Abner. These, each one of these, he leads off with a command, a commanding verb. Do these things. And he's kind of like a father who's getting them in trouble, bringing correction, right? And King David followed this coffin. So he's showing where he stands on this issue. And I wanna get into correction here. It says in Proverbs 12, one, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. And the thing is like, I know what you're thinking, what translation is that? That's the New King James. So like, just deal with that for a second. <laughs> he who hates correction is stupid. That's wisdom. <laughs> That's real simple and real basic. Because if a person is not interested, if, just think about that for a second. If we're not interested in correction, what's going on in our head? What are we thinking? Where is our heart at? Hebrews 12, 11 says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Like, okay, we know that this is not gonna be easy. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It's necessary. And then we have in 2 Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And here's what it's profitable for. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction. The word is going to be a manual to bring correction to my thinking and to my practices and my behavior. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That can't happen without correction. 
So they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And the king sang a lament over Abner and said, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put into fetters. As a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. Then all the people wept over him again. And when all the people came to persuade David to eat food while it was still day, David took an oath, saying, God do so to me and more also if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. Now all the people took note of it, and it pleased them, since whatever the king did pleased all the people. This is probably temporary, just saying. For all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's intent. And that's really what's going before King David. The way that he is handling the situation is making it abundantly clear, this was not what I wanted. This was not my desire. But think about it for just a moment. Like, think about cable news and putting spin on this and the talking heads and everything like that. This can be spun real quick. Oh, sure, David, you didn't have anything to do with this, right? Like, your number one adversary, the person who was really going to take it to you, Saul's number two person. You had nothing to do with this. But, I mean, the reality is here, we see, we see David's mourning, we see David's grieving. In fact, like, we kind of looked at this a little while ago, I think it was like with chapter one, David's not rejoicing here. He's not going, okay, the Lord's delivered me. This is great. He's mourning over each person that was part of God's plan and fell away. He mourns over that. Like, that's just the heart of a shepherd. A sheep that went astray, that got lost, that, that was taken out, that's hard on the shepherd. David has a heart after the Lord. Verse 38 says, Then the king said to his servants, Do you not know that the prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I am weak today, though anointed king. So I'm king, but I'm also a weak man today. And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, are too harsh for me. And that word harsh, it means severe, cruel, grievous, hard, obstinate, and this word stubborn. The Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. Now, I want to close this out with this other area that grieves me in this chapter. We've got the wives. We've got some violation in regards to what it says in Deuteronomy about kings. But this is this other situation right here. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. This is about the only kind of language that we really, really have in the New Testament that has to do with those who are over you in the church. And he's saying, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. He doesn't say it like, because I said so. He's giving a reason because they're looking out for you and those who must give an account. So everything that somebody who rules, right, everything they do, they're going to have to answer for every single thing. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. So like, this is not anything that I associate with and everything, but there are pastors that are like, and, and here's the thing, I knew one very dearly, and he had a church that he deeply struggled with. And he would say to me, like, he'd say, can you come? Can you speak at my church? Can you share some things? Because, man, these people, it's like they don't even know Jesus. And, and I grieved with him, and we prayed together, and I've been to, I had been to his church a number of times and shared some things and things like that. And this was a person who was just so, like, he, he was, like, almost kind of like from their perspective, maybe sort of like the hireling, where it's like, listen, you're, you're like new here. This is our church. We'll tell you how things go here. Oh, it was hard. It was cold. It was nothing like this verse. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. This wasn't the type of per pastor who in October was like, I don't even know what to say. I'm the most blessed guy in the world. You guys are the best sheep. I couldn't ever ask for something this great. It was hard. It was stubborn. It was obstinate. It was ugly. But we have something else that's going on here with David. This is big, really big. And this is what doesn't make sense to me. David is dealing with a very decisive, bold man and he happens to be doing so in an area that David is not very decisive. 
David is indecisive in regards to the situation with Joab. Why was Joab allowed to go forth? Like, yes, he corrected him. He yelled at him. He gave him a little kind of swat on the hand. He's like, get in line. We're carrying this coffin. We're going to mourn for Abner. Why wasn't Joab put to death? Seriously. Why wasn't this done really quickly? Why was this injustice met with such indecision? And this has been something I've been really dealing with and grieving over. Look at this. He murders Abner. He murdered Amasa, who's the nephew of David. He murders Absalom, who's the son of David. He murders Adonijah, who's the son of David. He conspires to make him king. I'm sorry, uh, that one he conspired to make him king, not murders him. And then also Uriah, he conspired with David to murder him. This would not have happened like this if he was decisive. Maybe he would have cut off other paths away. This whole situation with Uriah, when, when David was like, uh-oh, sin's got me. I'm going to just spend this week sinning. Don't ask me any questions. He was like, who can I talk to? Who can help me with this? Joab. He understands. He's a sinful man. And he did. He helped him with that. But Joab also did call him out on some stuff. Honestly, you could do a whole study on the man of Joab. There's some very interesting things from the beginning to the end of Joab. But here's what David himself said to his son, basically on his deathbed, as Solomon is taking the crown in 1 Kings chapter 2. He says to his son, moreover, you know also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me. You know what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner the son of Ner and Amasa the son of Jether, whom he killed. And he shed the blood of war in peacetime and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist and on the sandals that were on his feet. Therefore, do according to your wisdom and do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. Are you reading between the lines? Basically, what he's saying is, son, I've got two really serious regrets that I'm leaving with you to take care of. Don't let this man go down to the grave in peace. In First Chronicles, one of our favorite books, Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse. We remember Jesse, right? Jesse begot Eliab, his firstborn, Aminadab the second, Shemaiah the third, Nathanael the fourth, Radai the fifth, Ozem the sixth, and David the seventh. We know him. Now their sisters were Zeruiah and Abigail, and the sons of Zeruiah were Abishai, Joab, and Asahel. We've got a family problem. David is really, really good in so many ways, in so many areas. Remember what I was talking about with the Lord being the Lord of our family? Making hard decisions, doing hard things, letting him be Lord. Before today, I didn't know this. I actually just found this out at like two o'clock today. And I came across this like, you've got to be kidding. Because I made the case for Abner and Saul because Saul was the nephew of Abner. Abner was his uncle. David is the uncle to Joab, his nephew. And it just seems like when it comes to David's kiddos, his family, there's a certain indecisiveness that he's lacking. And his whole kingdom becomes compromised for, I don't even, it's not even years, it's generations because of this lingering indecisiveness. So let's pray. Lord, there are so many wonderful things that David has done. There's so many hard things, hard seasons that he has endured. And uh, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, kick a person while they're down, but I I have to seek what you're wanting us to know from this story and where David was failing in decisiveness, failing in in faithfulness to what was necessary for discipline and for correction or for justice. 
I, I just want to pray and ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and discernment for the things that come before us that we have to, we have to get right, for the things that we can't afford to get wrong that will be compromising to the most important people around us, compromising to our family, compromising to others. Help us to stand fast as shepherds, just like David, having that heart of a shepherd, going after the ones that are lost, but Lord, dealing with things decisively your way, not our way, not Joab's way, not David's way, your way. Lead us in this and teach us these things that we need to know personally by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.